Hello and welcome, Storyline, to our ongoing series on the life of Jacob, titled Jacob, the Faking, Breaking, and Making of a Man. My name is Pastor David Asherick, and we are in part two. Part two of our series on Jacob. This is going to be a lengthy series, at least seven parts, maybe eight parts. And so today we're going to be back in Genesis chapter 25. So welcome. So glad you're with us. Get your Bible, get a pad of paper or your phone or whatever you take notes on, because we're going to be looking at some, we're going to be looking at one episode, one event in particular that Again, we're going to we're sort of slow rolling this because in order to make sense of many of the things that happen later in Jacob's life, we have to lay very good groundwork to understand as we did in our last presentation and in this one that there were formative moments, like pivotal moments early in Jacob's life and in the Jacob narrative of scripture that set us up to understand everything that follows. And so today we're going to be almost entirely in Genesis chapter 25 a well-known story that we'll get to in just a second. And the title of our presentation today is No Soup for You. No Soup for You. We're going to start with prayer and we'll get right into the text of Scripture. Father in heaven, bless us now as we open the text, as we open your word. Lord, I pray that you would miraculously help us to see ourselves in these stories, that you by your spirit would do something supernatural and that you would just in a, in a, time travel like way help us to to go back to be transported back to these stories and to try to imagine them to see them and then to find those points of connection and relevance for ourselves uh, father be with us now as we open the text may you open us and may the spirit that inspired the word now become the spirit that instructs us in the word is my prayer in jesus name amen all right so part two of our jacob series titled no soup for you. We're just going to do a little bit of, I guess it's really not really review because we were in Genesis chapter 25 the last time we were together. And this is just picking up. In fact, I almost did part one and part two as one presentation, but it was just too much material. And I wanted to really dwell on the passage that we looked at last time, verse 23, two nations are in your womb. In fact, I think I've got that. Oh, I'll come up in a second. I've got it here in front of me. Two nations are in your womb. Two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other and the older will serve the younger. There's, there's just so much there. We talked about the idea of primogeniture, which we'll talk about again today, that I, I divided this presentation up into two, the, the birth of the twins and then this well-known story about the trickery, the deception, uh, or maybe deception is the wrong word, the taking advantage of surrounding the hunger of Esau and the soup or the pottage in the old King James version that uh, Jacob had made. And so I, I, I felt like, now we gotta, we gotta look at this, we gotta slow this down and really marinate, uh, to use a cooking word there, <laughs> to marinate in this story. And so that's what we're gonna be looking at today. No soup for you. And we're gonna start right, Genesis chapter 25, verses 27 and 28. The boys grew up. And Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau. And remember, this is the word we talked about last time, but Rebekah loved Jacob. And, and the use of the word but there, that conjunction, suggests to us that the specter doesn't just suggest, it spells outright that the specter of parental favoritism is very much on offer here in the text. And that is going to work itself out in unexpected and unfortunate ways, not only in the story of Jacob, but as we mentioned briefly last time, also in the story of Joseph, which we're not going to, in fact, I think I want to do a, a series on Joseph. If this goes really well and people love it, I think maybe my next series might be on or one of my next series will be on Joseph because I love the story of Joseph as well. Okay, uh, verses 29 to 31. Once, once rather, when Jacob was cooking some stew, right? Some soup, some stew, some food. Esau came in from the open country famished, right? He was hungry, he was starving. Verse 30, he said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. And that is why he is called Edom. Now we talked the last time we were together how the etymology of the name Esau is a little bit uncertain, but we do know that the word Edom means red, right? And there's this play on words here where, where Esau is red, 
The word Edom means red. The soup was red. So there's a lot going on here. We're going to talk a little bit about that. And then here, of course, we have the punchline, the rub, verse 31, where Jacob replies, first, sell me your birthright, right? Sell me your birthright. There's the rub, right? There's the, there's the bait and switch. Oh, you want some of my tasty, sweet smelling food? Sell me your birthright. And, and we're just immediately just right into the hostility, the struggle. Remember our last presentation was titled, The Struggle Begins, and how Jacob's whole life is, is steeped in struggle. And right here, as, as we're introduced to these boys, we see conflict, we see hostility, we see struggle. I mean, I'm the father of two sons. They're not twins, but they are very close in age. They're only 18 months apart. And from a very young age, like three, four, and ever since then, there has been a competitiveness, right? Sometimes even an outright hostility, because I think that's just kind of the nature. I mean, we talk about sibling rivalry, and at least in my experience, I'm only the father of boys. I have uh, friends that have uh, girls, and they say it's a little different, which I would imagine it would be. But when you have two boys, especially if they're very close in age, as in the case with my sons, just 18 months apart, life becomes a competition, right? Like an opportunity for one-upmanship where, oh, I did this a little better than you. I did this quicker than you. I got, you know, whatever it might be, there's this, this one-upmanship. And as the boys get older, right, into their teens and beyond, the relative difference in their age, in the case of my two sons, 18 months is a lot when you're four, when you're five, when you're six, but when you're 18, 19, you're basically the same age, very close. And so I have seen firsthand this brotherly competitiveness and this drive for one-upmanship that can happen in a home, right? I've seen it. And, and both of my boys are great kids. They love one another. They're just highly competitive. There's very competitive boys. And, and right here as we're introduced, or maybe not introduced, but as, as we begin right at the outset of the Jacob story, all we really have heard is the birth and the grabbing of the heel and the circumstances surrounding Rebecca's difficult pregnancy. But now when we're introduced to the actual interactions, right, the social interactions of these boys, there's one-upmanship, the desire to take advantage, a competitiveness, a hostility, and uh, we're going to get into this. It's going to be great. So I want to start by just making an observation here that you may or may not agree with. I don't have any biblical record, or I don't have any biblical, um, I, I can't prove what I'm going to say, right? There's no biblical warrant in terms of proof what I'm going to say, but I think that that we can read between the text here, read between the lines and see that what's going on here was purposeful, it was intentional. And so that's why I put here on the screen. In my view, this interaction was not serendipitous. It was not haphazard, it was planned. And the hunter, Esau, has become the hunted. Now, just a word on that. I, I'm not a hunter myself, but I have friends that are hunters. And I do know, because I've spent a lot, I love the wilderness. I love spending time in the outdoors, backpacking, rock climbing, fly fishing, doing the things that I love to do outside. I do know that if you're going to try and hunt an animal, one of the very best ways to do that, most reliable ways to do that, is to find where the animal goes to either get water or food, right? So if you can find the water or you can find the food, you can find, you can find the animal. And while Jacob is not himself a hunter, remember he's the domestic man, the Tom man. We talked about that Hebrew word Tom the last time we were together. He's somebody who, who understands the world around him. He knows how hunting works, though he himself is not a hunter. And I believe that what's happening here is that this isn't just a serendipitous, oh, one day he, he just happened to be making some food, happened to be making some stew, and lo and behold, here comes his famished brother. Oh, no, no, no. I think this is planned. I think it's purposeful. And the food is there in the hopes that Esau will come in in a vulnerable condition, perhaps having hiked for you know miles or days even to get back and he's vulnerable and this is an opportunity for Jacob to take advantage to to hunt the hunter to lie in wait at the place where water is taken or where food is taken and I believe that's what's going on here and I'm going to try to build my case to that effect that this isn't just serendipitous okay we're going to start by looking at a at a quotation here from Walter Brueggemann well-known 
uh, Bible commentator and theologian scholar. In his commentary on Genesis, which I have really enjoyed reading, I don't go everywhere that Brugman goes, but I like many of his observations about the narrative. And this is a, a really important sort of table setting statement here that I, I just knew had to be included. And we're actually going to refer to this a couple times in the series. Uh, he says, the Jacob narrative is most lifelike. And we've made that point already, that there is a relatability to this story, right? This isn't an old, antiquated, dusty, irrelevant, unrelatable story. No, no, no. Brueggemann makes the point that we've made. This is relatable, right? This narrative is the most lifelike, he says, and he means of the patriarchs, of the Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. We can relate to Jacob. He continues, the grandson of the promise is a rascal compared to his faithful grandfather Abraham or his successful father Isaac. Great word. I, I like that word for Jacob. I think it captures a lot about Jacob. He's a rascal, right? And we're going to see that, that, that rascalness on full display in today's story. Brugman continues, the narrator knows that the purposes of God, and watch this, are tangled in a web of self-interest and self-seeking. Right? As the story is being told here, this is not a sanitized, you know, hero myth that through layers of mythologization have, you know, given us an, an untouchable, unrelatable hero figure. No. No, no. He says the purposes of God are tangled in this complex web of self-interest and self-seeking. Brugman continues, the narrative is realistic. Exactly. That's why it's relatable. The narrative is realistic about power and position in the family, about the practices and promise of deception, about wages and departures and reconciliation. We'll get all to all, to all of that in the future. The narrative is attentive to all of these interactions, these common, very realistic, very lifelike interactions, and we can relate to it. It's realistic, right? I, as I've already mentioned, I have two sons. I can easily imagine a situation. In fact, I don't even have to imagine. I could report, you know, catalogs. I could report episodes, stories of my two sons trying to create and manipulate circumstances and situations in which they can gain an advantage over their brother, whether it's something just like simple in a basketball game or who can get to mom or dad first to say, mom, this is what happened, dad, this is what happened. I mean, the, the, <laughs> this is, I'm, I'm describing something here that really has been Violetta and I's home life for the last two decades, right? Where you just see that there's a competitiveness there. And again, the boys love one another, they love us, but there's something about, especially boys, the desire to compete, the desire to one up the other, and uh, especially if the boys are close in age. And these guys are twins. I mean, separated only by moments moments. We put that slide up the last time we were together that, that Ed Dickerson in his book Torn puts those words into Jacob's mouth that my, my whole life, the woes of my life are attributable to those few fleeting moments that separate our births, right? So you can just imagine the intensity here of the competition, which would have been fueled further by the favoritism of one by the mother and the other by the father. So this is a hyper competitive, even at times downright hostile environment. And it's going to play out in a scene that you might be familiar with. You maybe know the story. You've read this story. We're going to look at it and try to unpack these sort of pivotal. We're not just going to look at the story in isolation. We're going to allow this story to be a part of this series that will help us to see how this pivot will affect the life of especially Jacob, but also even of Esau. And so we're going to try to read this into its larger context. So, so in this event, the event about the, the soup and Esau coming in from a hunt famished, the specific circumstances of the young men's births have become strangely prophetic. Okay, now we'd already mentioned that in, in the ancient world, very often people were named uh, children were named relative to the circumstances of their birth. And, and Jacob's name, uh, which again, we say in the English, we sort of soften the J there. We say Jacob, we, we make a long A. But, but the word here is Jacob or Yaakov even. And in the Hebrew, and that word, as we've already noted, means that name means heel catcher, a layer of snares. Okay, well, there you go. Right, that's what's happening here. This, this is my point. This is not just a serendipitous 
you know, opportunistic encounter where all of a sudden Jacob goes, oh, I've got my brother in a vulnerable position. Oh, no, 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 no. These two are in a continual adversarial relationship of one-upmanship, laying traps, laying snares, leveraging the favoritism of mom or of dad to try to take an advantage. And so his name is apt. It's prophetic. A layer of snares and a supplanter. And just to remind ourselves, that word supplanter, here's some synonyms. Overthrow, undermine, unseat, usurp, eject, expel, oust, cast out or force out. And again, we made the point, we'll make it again. This is not a particularly flattering or complimentary name. I mean, right? Like your name is basically cheater. And we, we also noted that, and we'll talk about this in the future, that Jacob can mean crooked, right? Like inbuilt to the etymology there is not a straight line, but a crooked line. And if you're already beginning to feel a little bit of tension and saying, well, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. We were told in our last session that he was, that he was a domestic person, a tom, the Hebrew word tom, which is translated, at least in the case of, uh, as we saw Noah and Job, as perfect. And so if you're feeling that sort of moral tension here, wait a minute, his name means crooked, his name means, you know, supplanter or layer of snares, but he's also supposed to be this upright person. If you're feeling a little tension there, a little ambiguity and inscrutability, you're supposed to. The narrative, as we will see, does not have these nice, clean, black and white moral lines where we can easily and flatly say, good guy, bad guy, you know, right, wrong. In, in fact, there is, a, a, as Brueggemann just said, a tangled web of self-interest and of self-seeking here. And it's not always easy to tell who the good guy is. Now, we've already read this, but let's just go back and look at it again, especially verse 31, this first sell me your birthright, right? Sell me your birthright. Now, the last time we were together, we talked about this word. And if we don't get our mind around not just this word, but the meaning of this word and how it was absolutely inbuilt, this is how we ended our last presentation, that, that this idea of primogeniture is just, it was the conventional wisdom. It was the way the world worked, right? It was unfair. It was unjust. It wasn't a meritocracy, right? It's not like the, the parents would look at their children and say, well, which is which is the one that would be the most qualified to receive X, Y, or Z? In this case, the inheritance and the Abrahamic covenant blessing. No, no, that's not how it worked. If you were the first, you were the what? Right? That's primogeniture. You can see there in the, in the second definition, an exclusive right of inheritance belonging to the oldest son. Right? And so while it is the way the world worked, it was the conventional wisdom of the day, I think you would agree with me there is an inbuilt unfairness to this. There's an injustice to it. It's not fair. It's not the way it should be. If somebody's going to receive a, a coveted blessing, a coveted covenant blessing, that should be based on character, on personality, on the merits of the individual. Are they worthy of the blessing? But that's not what happens here. And that's not the story. The, the story here, as we mentioned last time, part of the story here is that God, the sovereign God of the universe, is going to intervene and interject himself into the human system, into an, a real family that really existed, that had real hostilities and real dysfunctions. And God is going to work not around, God is going to work in and through this family, through the social conventions. This is the story of the book of Genesis. It's the story of beginnings. It's the story of how Yahweh, how God progressively, you could even say glacially, incrementally reveals himself. And it just keeps going all the way through, not just Genesis, but all the way through Torah, through the Old Testament, until finally we have the consummation of God's revelation to us in Christ. But in these early stages here, in the book of beginnings, in the book of Genesis, they are very much seeing through a glass darkly, right? What they do know is that their father, in the case of Isaac, and grandfather, in the case of Jacob, Abraham, had a promise made to him, and that there have been a series of providential and miraculous um, breakthroughs whereby Yahweh has revealed himself to this family. And so they have made, uh, not the other gods, not the gods of their ancestors, they have made this God their God, right? That's what we know. He's, the, he's literally called, through much of Scripture, especially Torah, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 
Just reflecting back momentarily, when God had called Abraham out of the land of the Ur of the Chaldees, out of Mesopotamia, which means the land between the two rivers, he literally said, get out of your father's house from your land to a land that I will show you. Well, well, scholars are agreed about this, and it makes a lot of sense in the ancient world, that when you called somebody away from a land and away from a clan and away from a family, you were calling them away from the gods, right? The, the sort of deities, the respective deities of that group. And of that area, these deities were very often, you know, located geographically to that mountain or that river or that tribe or that clan or that land. And so when Abraham is being displaced and when his descendants, Isaac and Jacob, his grandson, are being displaced, they're going to need a new God. They're going to need someone that's going to look out for them, someone up there. And and remember, at this point in the narrative, these are not, you know, they, they are not uh, rigid monotheists. They are not what the Jews will later become with this incredible innovation that, that Judaism will bring to the world, that there is only one God, the true God, the creator God. No, we're not there yet in the story. We're in the book of Genesis. And Yahweh, right, the, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is one among many of the gods. And this will become clear to us as the story unfolds, but it's important to sort of bear this in mind because because the, the, the desire of the firstborn here, or the desire of, of, of Jacob and Esau, is to receive that special blessing, that, that, that special conventional blessing that will be given to, lavished upon the firstborn, simply by virtue of the fact that you were born first. Okay, so we have to bear this in mind as we sort of think about the Abrahamic story and the story of Jacob within the larger flow of the biblical narrative. All right. So in my mind's eye, and I don't, again, I don't have a Bible text where I can prove this, but tell me if you agree here, it seems impossible to imagine that Rebecca hadn't told Jacob, Yaakov, of her prayer and of the mysterious answer, right? I I just can't imagine a scenario in which she has not told Jacob about the circumstances of the birth and the promise Two nations, two peoples. In fact, I've got it. I think I've got it right here. Right? The Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. Two peoples will be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. I mean, did Rebecca not tell this to Jacob? I, I, I don't see how that works. Of course she did. Right? As the boys age, and, and this is borne out by the fact that there was favoritism. Right, we've already highlighted this favoritism. Verse 28 of Genesis 25. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. And and I think that it's fair for us to surmise that that Rebekah's affinity for Jacob was was informed, rather, by her knowledge of his prophesied and privileged fate. I mean, that just makes so much sense. She would have had, not only because he was domestic, not only because he remained in and around the tents, unlike the wild roving Esau who loved to be out with the thrill of the hunt and the chase. But she knows, right? She knows God spoke to her when she went and made inquiry. No, no, he's the one. The older will serve the younger. This overturning of conventional wisdom, this overturning of primogeniture. She is effectively, in fact, this is how I say it. In effect, what Rebecca is doing is she is, uh, let me just read it here. In effect, she was betting on the team that she knew in advance was going to win, right? God has told her the older will serve the younger. And so it makes a lot of sense that Jacob would have been her favorite. And for the sort of personality sketches or the character profiles that we did last time, where we sort of looked at the the psychology of Isaac and the character profile there and the psychology of Rebecca and the character profile there, we read that statement from Patriarchs and Prophets where where Ellen White says, well, yes, the, the sort of quiet and domestic Uh, Isaac, he loved the idea of his roving son out on these wild, adventurous hunts. And conversely, Rebecca really loved Jacob, not only because he was domestic and studious and kind and attentive in in the home domestic situation, but because she knew. Because she knew. And, And so here's the punchline in this interaction. The punchline comes up in verse 31, sell me your birthright. Oh, you want some of my tasty stew? And again, I, I've just got to say, this is not serendipitous, right? This isn't, um, this isn't like, oh, look, I just happen to be making some food. I don't, I, this is a snare. This is a trap that has been laid. The hunter 
is now hunted. This is classic sibling rivalry, one-upmanship, leveraging circumstances and situations. Jacob knew that Esau would be coming home. He, he had a sense of how long he's been gone on the hunt. Has he been gone a day? Has he been gone? How long has he been gone? He's going to come back. And every time he comes back, he's famished. He's hungry. He's starving. Oh, I'll make up this stew. He's going to walk. Oh, hey, hey, great to see you. He knows this is a trap that's been laid. And so when Jacob says, tell me if you go with me on this. When Jacob says, first sell me your birthright, I'd like to suggest what he's really saying is, first sell me my birthright. Because Jacob has a sense of entitlement. Again, I'm, I'm proceeding from the, I think, entirely reasonable premise here that, that Jacob knows because the mother, Rebecca, has reported to him that that birthright is going to be his. He believes that. He wants it. He craves it. He covets it. He longs for this birthright, this special access to the Abrahamic promise, the, the access that Abraham and his own father Isaac had to this blessing of Yahweh, right? This, this powerful God. And so Jacob desired the birthright and the material as well as the spiritual privileges that attended it. But this is crucial right here. But Jacob himself didn't yet know the God who had given the promises of blessing to his faith-filled grandfather. In other words, he wants something because he thinks it's going to give him a, 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 a privileged position in the family and to receive the Abrahamic blessing, but he doesn't really understand what he wants. He doesn't really get it. He doesn't grasp its significance, the, the spiritual significance of what it is that he wants. He doesn't, because again, we've already talked about the, the sort of incremental, almost glacial revelation of God in Scripture through the whole of the book of Genesis, through all of Torah, through the Old Testament. And then finally, God shows up in grandeur and glory and beauty in the incarnation, in Christ, crucifixion, resurrection, ascension. But this is not yet known to Jacob. What Jacob knows is that in the ancient world, you sought to win the favor of deities to, or to placate and assuage their wrath by doing things. And so having the favor of a deity, especially a powerful deity like Yahweh has shown himself to be already, this is going to be good for him. Right? He wants this. He desires it. But, but he doesn't really know about the nature of the thing that he wants yet. And I'm just going to say a brief word about this. It's so easy and natural to read the Bible backward. And what I mean by that is we, we come to these Old Testament stories and we look through the lens, right, through the glasses of our awareness of how the whole story turns out. We know Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. We know the New Testament. We know the death, burial, resurrection, ascension. We know the intercession of Jesus. We know his return. Yeah, yeah, okay, true, but Jacob doesn't yet know that. Neither does Isaac or Abraham. And so what we have to learn to do is not just read the Bible backward, assuming that all the things that we now know, they also knew. No, they didn't know. See, we have to learn how to read, and this is the more challenging. It takes discipline to go back and read. This is the, this is the uh, enterprise of hermeneutics, to understand the text. What did the original author mean to the original audience in the original context and language? That's what we're trying to figure out here. So, so moving forward, we can surmise that Jacob wanted something. He coveted it, he desired it, but he didn't really know what it was that he wanted. He didn't really know what it entailed, and he certainly doesn't know much about the one true God that's offering it. All that's going to become clearer and clearer as the story unfolds. Now, Ellen White and Patriarchs and Prophets, excellent book, by the way, which I really love her. Uh, there's a, two or three chapters here on Jacob, and I, I've read them over and over again. And this is what she says. The promises made to Abraham and confirmed to his son were held by Isaac and Rebekah as the object of their desires and hopes, right? They were the inheritors of the Abrahamic promise. Uh, it's amazing. It's beautiful. With these promises, Esau and Jacob were familiar. Well, of course they were, right? Just as, just as Abraham had taught Isaac, Isaac and Rebekah are now, I should say, Abraham and Sarah taught Isaac. Isaac and Rebekah are now teaching their sons, right? They were taught to regard the birthright as a matter of great importance. Okay, it's important. Why? For it included not only the inheritance of worldly wealth, but spiritual preeminence. Spiritual preeminence. Okay, not only material, we've already talked about how the, the primogeniture notion is unjust and unfair, and it's not based on a meritocracy, who deserves it, but just who was born first. She continues, he who received it was to be the priest of the family, and in the line of his posterity, the redeemer of the world would come. 
On the other hand, there were obligations, key word, responsibilities, duties. There were obligations resting upon the possessor of the birthright. He who should inherit its blessing must devote his life to the service of God. Like Abraham, he must be obedient to the divine requirements and in marriage and in his family relations, this will become very important for us as we move forward in this story, in public life, he must consult the will of God. In other words, the covenant is not just opportunities and privileges, it's responsibilities and duties, right? And so what Jacob thinks he has to have, what he thinks he wants, which is some special magical favor from this powerful deity, Yahweh, he doesn't really know what it is that he wants. Okay, so to state the obvious here, God's will and the promises that flow from God's will do not require human cleverness or worse yet, sin to eventuate, right? Like, like, like this is one of the great points in the story that's on offer here is that God doesn't need human cleverness or human devising. In fact, this is one of the major motifs in the whole book of Genesis that God works in his way. God's word is strong. It's stable. It's reliable. It's faithful. And he doesn't need, whether it's Sarah, you know, summoning Abraham and saying, lay with my handmaiden Hagar. Well, that turns out to be a giant mess. Or whether it's Adam and Eve sowing fig leaves to cover themselves, right? There's just story after story in Genesis, story after story in scripture, and story after story in human history is human beings trying to make a way, right? But very often a way that's crooked, Jacob, right? A way that's not straight, a way that's not in keeping with God's will and with God's character. And just as in the last presentation, we flashed forward to 1 Corinthians, I'm gonna flash forward to Romans chapter three and feel this, right? Feel what Paul says here in terms of the sort of the end justifies the means ethic, which is clearly what Jacob is oper operating by here. He wants to secure a spiritual thing. He wants to secure something that is, he understands at some level is spiritual and requires moral rectitude and uprightness like his father and his grandfather, but he's gonna do it through devious means. He's gonna ensnare his brother. He's gonna take advantage of his brother. And, and Paul speaks to this sort of, this uh, relativism whereby we can try to attain a good thing by doing a bad thing, right? He says in verse five of Romans chapter three, but if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Jumping to verse seven. But if through my lie, God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? And why not do evil that good may come? And Paul says, as some people slanderously charge us with saying, their condemnation is just. What Paul's saying is here, is saying here is that this is absurd, right? Like, like if God is, and of course, now again, reading not just backward, but forward, Paul understands who God is. He has Torah. He has the revelation of God in Christ. So Paul knows a lot more, certainly than, than Jacob or Esau knows. But the point here stands nonetheless, and that is that the idea that I'm going to do a, an evil thing so that good may eventuate, he says, that's, a, that's not the way it works with this God. This is not an ends justifies the means God. This is not a God that works around principle, that works around love, that works around integrity. This is a God that's always going to work in and through those things because God is love in himself. He's not going to go outside of his nature and character to try to achieve some good. And so, uh, yeah, he says, no, that, that, that people that think that way, their condemnation is just because then you have no limiting principle, right? If the end justifies the means and I can just do any bad thing to bring about an imagined good, what's the limiting principle? I can act in any immoral way as long as I can, in some convoluted sense, imagine that I'm going to bring about some greater good by my immoral actions. Well, no, this is classic moral relativism. God is not a moral relativist and his followers, followers are not called to be moral relativists. We do what is right because it is right. And we let God in his own wonderful way work out as we are patient, right? We talked about that the last time we were together. Rather than knowing the future, we put our hand in the hand of the God who knows the future because it's better than the light and safer than the known. That beautiful poem from Minnie Haskins. Okay, so Jacob says, first, sell me my birthright. I believe that's what's going on here. Not sell me your birthright, not sell me the birthright. He feels a sense of entitlement. 
Because again, and I just can't imagine a circumstance in which Rebecca has not told him that he will eventually have some kind of superiority over his brother. The overturning of primogeniture. She doesn't know how it's going to happen. He doesn't know how it's going to happen. So rather than waiting patiently, he's going to make it happen. And this is his opportunity. He's laid the trap. He's laid the snare. And just as we see Jacob's personality on display here, and again, the Bible is so amazing. It's so masterfully written. One of the reasons that we're still paying attention to the Bible thousands of years after these stories have been written and these narratives have been recorded is because they're so beautiful. They're so accurate. They're so true to life. We don't have to force ourselves to read a dusty old book. It draws us in. It invites us in because it's so relatable. It's so beautiful. It's so true to life. And so just as we've seen the kind of person that Jacob is, Jacob, in his uh, laying a snare here for his brother, we also see what kind of a person Esau is, right? So Esau's response to this is, look, man, I'm about to die. What good is this birthright to me? You can just feel it there, can't you? That almost disregard of his ancestral inheritance, right? Like, well, you, you feel the dismissiveness with which he regards the inheritance. What, what good is this? And I'm going to do something here in Genesis 25, 32. I'm going to insert one word that I think actually gives us a feel for what's really going on here, right? What's the subtext? What is Esau saying when he says, look, man, I'm starving. I'm hungry. What good is this birthright to me now? That's the point. When he says, what good is this birthright to me? He's not taking this sort of cosmic panoramic view of his own life. He just says, man, I'm hungry. I'm famished. I've just come back from a long hunt, a long hike, and here's some delicious food. It's immediately available to me right here, right now in this moment. And so when we just insert that word now, I think it really teases out and helps us to see what's on offer here. See, see, compare the two brothers. Jacob is thinking long-term a little bit. He's, how do I attain? Now, he's actually not thinking as long-term as he should be. We'll come to that in just a second. But he's laying a trap. He's, he's laying a plan here. He's doing evil that good may come. Not Esau, man. Esau's a man of the moment, right? He's a, he's a man of the moment. There's an impulsivity there. There's an impatience there. And so he says, well, what, what birthright? This soup smells delicious. This food looks amazing. What is this, what, what is this birthright doing for me now? And so it's not, e it's not difficult to see that Esau's answer here reveals a selfish short-sightedness. What good is this birthright to me? Again, he doesn't take the collective, covenantal, corporate, familial view of reality. To me. To me. And of course, nobody lives in isolation. We are born into families. We are part of communities. We, we shouldn't come into any given situation and just say, what's, what's good for me? Well, that's called narcissism. Narcissism. That's being a sociopath or a psychopath. That's, a, that's not, no, no, we're a part of a community. We're, it's not just what's good for me. It's what's good for me and my wife, right? I have a, a wife and then I have children and then I have a mom and I have a dad and I have brothers and I have sisters. So when we're making decisions about what we should do and what we shouldn't do, if we're, if we're thinking only in the most reductionistic, isolationist, what about for me? What, what, what's good for me in this situation? Well, that's very Esau-like. Yeah, yeah, what good is his birthright to me? And so he takes this very narrow, selfish, short-sighted view, and unsurprisingly, the New Testament castigates him for this short-sightedness. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 16 and 17. See that no one is like godless Esau who for a single meal, and you can just feel the dismissiveness here of the author of Hebrews, for a single meal, the incredulity is on offer. He can't believe it. For a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Verse 17, afterward, as you know, when he wanted to inherit this blessing, he was rejected. Even though he sought the blessing with tears, he could not change what he had done. We'll come back to that when we get into the deception of Isaac, which is, a, I think it's our next presentation, actually. It is our next presentation. Okay, so, so yes, easy interpretation. It's easy to see. It's right on the surface that Esau's answer here, what good is this birthright to me now, reveals a selfish short-sightedness and a narrowness and an impulsivity and an individualism that was not in keeping with that sort of larger Abrahamic promise. Remember that the Abrahamic promise was, Abraham, in you, 
all the nations of the earth will be blessed. All the families of the earth. So talk about inclusivity. I mean, this is maximally inclusive. And so Esau's response here is very outside of the divine intent in giving the Abrahamic covenant. Right? What good is this to me? Well, the Abrahamic covenant was never about what was good to an individual. It was God's answer to the sin of Adam. God was going to put the world back together through the Abrahamic covenant to the promises that he would make and keep to Abraham and his descendants. Esau here is showing himself to be an unworthy heir of the Abrahamic promise. But again, primogeniture has the world all turned upside down. Who's born first gets the best. And so I guess that's just the way it's going to be. But God says, no, it's not going to be that way. But here, Jacob, rather than resting in and trusting in, because he also, like Esau, in that hostile, hyper-competitive sibling environment, I'm going to suggest that Jacob's offer of the pottage, the soup for the birthright, actually reveals a selfish short, short-sightedness. Do, do you feel that? In other words, it's not just Esau who's selfish and short-sighted when he says, what good is this birthright to me now? Well, what's Jacob doing here? Right? Like, Jacob is taking into his hands a highly spiritual, highly prized spiritual inheritance that came down through the lineage of his godly grandfather and his godly father. And now he thinks he's going to lay a snare as if God's will and God's covenant blessing requires his ingenuity, his taking advantage of his brother. I mean, you might say, who's the good guy here? Right, right, because it's easy in the Cain and Abel story, right? We look at Cain and Abel and we say there's, there's really clear moral lines about right and wrong and black and white and who was the good guy and who was the bad guy. Easy, not here. In answer to the question, who is the good guy here? There isn't one. Now, now you can't say Esau's the good guy in any sense, but you can't say Jacob's the good guy either. And let's remind ourselves of this statement that we already read from Brueggemann. The narrative is realistic. The narrative is realistic about power and position in the family, about the practices of promise and deception. Exactly. This is why it's so relatable, because we can relate to this. I mean, this is not, and I've said it before, and I'm going to say it again. He's not a sanitized hero. You know, we're, we're not getting the story of Jacob through these layers of mythologizing where what finally is spit out the other end through all of these layers of legendary embellishment is ta-da, you know, an unapproachable, unattainable hero figure. Now, this dude is like my own sons. He's like me. Absolutely, to totally relatable. And so, as I just mentioned a moment ago, in the story of Esau and Jacob, we can hear the echoes of Cain and Abel, right? Sibling rivalry, conflict between the brothers, but there's far less moral clarity in this story than in the Cain and Abel story, right? And so let's go back. Let's, let's flip back there to verse 32. Look, I'm about to die. Esau says, what good is this birthright to me now, right? What good is it to me taking that hyper individualistic rather than the collective view of reality, the short sighted rather than the sort of panoramic view of reality. Now here's where Jacob presses his point. Verse 33, you can just feel the manipulative taking advantage, you know, tension in the story here. You have to fill in. You have to put some muscle on the skeleton of the narrative. Because if you just read this through, you think, oh, I didn't get all of that. Well, go back and read it through. Read it through again and again and read it as a part of the larger narrative. And it starts to flesh out in a way where you're like, oh, oh no, I see that. Jacob presses his advantage here. Swear to me first. Swear to me first. Before I give you a morsel, you can smell it, but you can't taste it. Before I give you a morsel of this delicious food that your body is craving, right? Significant you know, he's in a, running a major calorie deficit here if he's just come back from this big hike, this big hunt, and he's famished. Swear to me first. Talk about taking a hyper-individualistic view. Rather than being his brother's keeper, hearkening back to the Cain and Abel narrative, again, which is very similar, but with greater moral clarity, rather than being his brother's keeper, he is here his brother's manipulator. He's going to manipulate his brother. He's going to take advantage. He's going to lay a snare in keeping with his name. Crooked. Layer of snares. Yaakov. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. And we just read there in Hebrews chapter 12, this is why the author of Hebrews looks with dismay and disdain on this short-sighted decision. And, and at just that moment, you can imagine when he says, okay, fine, you can have the stupid birthright. It's no good to me now. Jacob is just like, yes, 
he got it. Because again, this wasn't opportunistic. It wasn't serendipitous. It didn't just happen. I don't, I don't buy that. This was a snare. The hunter has been hunted and the trap has worked to perfection. It's just worked absolutely perfectly. And when Esau signs off on the bargain, Jacob just goes, yeah, I got you. I hunted the hunter. I got an advantage. Esau feels kind of indifferent about it. I'll get to that in just a second. He just wants the food, man. So Jacob now had the precious, long-desired birthright. But in another sense, I'm going to suggest that Jacob didn't have that birthright at all because he didn't have the sense of it. He didn't have the meaning of it. He didn't know what it was that he was trying to attain by manipulative, coercive, deceitful means. And uh, Ellen White actually taps into this. Again, Patriarchs and Prophets. He who received it, we've already talked about this. I've actually already read this. This is to remind ourselves of the, of the moral uprightness and the rectitude that was expected of the inheritor of the birthright. Again, it wasn't just like a widget or a figurine or something that could just, you know, be acquired and bought and sold. And, you know, this is more than an economic transaction. So let's just remind ourselves. He who received it was to be the priest of his family. Well, is this priestly behavior? It is not. And in the line of his posterity, the redeemer of the world would come. On the other hand, there were obligations resting upon the possessor of the birthright. He who should inherit its blessings must devote his life to the service of God. Well, they don't know much about this God, what kind of a God he is, what his nature is, what his character is. They know a little bit. They know enough to, he knows enough not to be making this decision. Like Abraham, he must be obedient to the divine requirements in marriage and in his family relations. He must consult with the will of God. Well, here's the question. Has he consulted the will of God here? In laying this snare and laying this trap for his brother, the answer is he has not. He has not. Well, once the deal was made, once Esau signed on the dotted line, then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and he drank and he got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. Esau despised, he was dismissive of it. He didn't care about it. What good is this stupid birthright to me now? Okay, Ellen White comments on this. Thus Esau despised his birthright. In disposing of it, he felt a sense of relief. Just, he just shook it off. Right? It, because there would have been the fatherly expectation, not with Rebecca, because Rebecca already knows that that's not what's going to happen. But, but Esau, for, uh, but Jacob for reasons, uh, excuse me, but Isaac for reasons that will become clear to us, he still believed in Esau. He favored Esau. He liked Esau. And so he would have been putting a lot of parental pressure, as parents often do. They put parental pressure or expectation. Oh, your granddad was a doctor and your dad was a doctor. So you need to be a doctor. Right? A lot of, there's a lot of these parental expectations to live up to some economic standard or some familial standard or some, you know, educational standard. Well, he's not, he doesn't want that, right? He just wants to go hunting. There's a, there's a desire, the freedom to just roam and be his own man. He doesn't want to be constrained by the obligations of the Abrahamic blessing, but he certainly would have been happy to have had the material benefit and blessing of the Abrahamic covenant. Okay, so he feels a sense of relief now. Now his way was unobstructed. No more obstructions. Nope, nope, everything's fine now. He could do as he liked. For this wild pleasure, Ellen White says, miscalled freedom. She makes a great point of sort of pastoral application here. How many are still selling their birthrights to an inheritance pure and undefiled eternal in the heavens? Great point of pastoral application. Rather than taking the long view, she's saying, many people are taking the narrow, short short-sighted, selfish view and making eternally consequential decisions in a moment of impulsivity. She's not wrong. She is not wrong at all. And that's the lesson of Esau. I preached a sermon years ago called Esau and his ilk. And it was about that very thing, how, how Esau, the word ilk means kind or people, right? The, the kinds of people that are like Esau are those that make decisions in the moment, impulsive, self-centered, sensual decisions that have consequences for later in life, but they don't see the consequences because they don't take the pan panoramic large view of reality. They take the narrow individualistic view of reality, the impulsive in the moment view of reality. And so here's the text, but I'm going to throw in something here, just as I threw in the word now, what good is this birthright to me now? I'm going to throw in something that when I first put it up, you might be like, what? I, what? I don't, I don't get it. I, I'm not sure I go there. So let me read this. Genesis 25, 34 again. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. 
He ate and drank, then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. Yep, agree. Yep, that all checks out. That makes sense to me. But watch what I'm going to add right here. And so did Jacob. What? What, what, what do you mean, David? Well, in fact, what might have even been better there would have been, but so did Jacob. Right? Like we all can sign off on the idea here, as the author of Hebrews says, that Esau's decision here is short-sighted, it's selfishness, and it's a despising of. I mean, the Abrahamic blessing and, and covenant is to put the world back together, the, the world that is falling apart through sin and rebellion, to, to fix the world that was made, uh, that, that was made uh, you know, in the image of the fall of Adam. I mean, this is a giant, beautiful, grand, in fact, it's the gospel is what it is, that God is going to put the world back together. But Esau doesn't care. He, he, he has a diamond. He has, he has the greatest of all possible diamonds, but he doesn't know what he has, and so he doesn't care about what he has. And so, yeah, the author of Hebrews and all of us can look and say, yeah, that, what, a, what a poor move, what a bad bargain, right? What a, uh, no, he despised his birthright. But I'm suggesting here that it wasn't only Esau that despised his birthright. I'm suggesting that Jacob himself is despising the birthright. You might say, no, he wants the birthright. Yeah, he wants what he thinks the birthright is, but he doesn't know what the birthright is, right? Neither brother understood the, the true value and meaning of the birthright. No, neither of them know what they have, now, yes, Jacob has a more of an understanding, but if he thinks it's the kind of thing that can be attained by laying a snare and manipulating your brother, then you don't understand what the birthright is. So yes, Esau despised his birthright, and so did Jacob. He despised its nature, its essence. Now, Jacob will one day come to a correct and transformative understanding of the beauty of the Abrahamic covenant. Yes, that will happen, but so far as we are aware, Esau never did. Right? Like, like, like the trajectory of Esau's life is unchanged, and we'll see that as near as we can tell. We don't know as much about Esau as we do about Jacob. But as near as we can tell, Esau's life is basically a straight trajectory. It's like an arrow, you know, that he would shoot on his hunts. It's just wherever it, whatever the circumstances under which it leaves the bow, that's, you know, nothing comes in and interferes. That's just, that's what it's going to be. Jacob's life starts off one way and he's going to have a major turn. The faking, breaking, and making of a man. Right? So let's make a few just observations here. God works in and through broken people, dysfunctional families, and even the selfish decisions of his people. Say it again for the people in the back. Right? God doesn't sanction this kind of behavior. Right? I say it this way in my book, God in Pain. What God uses is not synonymous with what he chooses. Right? God can use things that he himself doesn't sanction. Because people are making decisions. They're making free will decisions. Jacob made the decision to lay a trap. And Esau made the decision to sell his birthright. If a birthright, in fact, is the kind of thing that can be sold, which we'll talk about in the future. Okay? These are free decisions that are made. So, so God can only work with what's available to him. He's got to work with what he's got. And so God works in and through broken people, dysfunctional families, and even the selfish decisions of his people. It doesn't mean he sanctions those decisions or the behavior. He does not. But he's got to work with what, what, what he's given. What an incredible story to think that, that it's, not only, it's not just this simple, flat narrative where it's really obvious, here's the good guy, here's the bad guy. No, no, both of these guys are the bad guys. I think you would agree with me. Esau's the bad guy for despising his birthright and taking a, a, a narrow view of the situation and of the Abrahamic covenant and blessing. True, check. But how is Jacob any better? In fact, you could even say Jacob's worse here because he actually has, at least at some level, a greater understanding than Esau has, but he thinks it's the kind of thing that can be achieved by deceit and manipulation. No, God's will doesn't require human cleverness, much less human sin, to bring about his will in the world. Now, is God going to work through this? Is, yeah, of course he is. Of course he is. But God doesn't sanction this behavior. So much of the Bible is not prescriptive, describing behavior that we should, we should acquire and, and aspire to, but it's descriptive. It's just telling us what happened. Okay, this is what we do at the end of each presentation. We did it in the first one. We're going to do it again. A brief summary and sort of some takeaway, takeaways and applications for us. Number one, as we've already said several times here, the Bible's characters and stories are not, or excuse me, are real and relatable. They are not sanitized hero myths. Check. 
Number two, spiritual things are spiritually discerned. That's quoting Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. Esau, does he understand the birthright and its significance and its character and its nature? No, he does not. But neither does Jacob. Now, Jacob understands more than Esau, but he doesn't get it. He thinks it's the kind of thing that can be acquired by deception. How about number three? God's timing is better than ours. We talked about this in our first presentation, putting your hand in the hand of God and letting that be better than the light and safer than the known. What Jacob should have done, and we're going to see this, this is going to come back to us in our next presentation, he should have just been patient. He should have said, hey, look, if, if God made my mom this promise, then let's see what happens. But too often, we try to do for God. We try to create circumstances rather than, and I'm not talking here about a passivity or an apathy whereby you just sit on your hands idly and don't make things happen. What I'm saying is, is we don't have to manipulate or take advantage of others. We don't have to do evil that good may come. Let's just let God be God and let's let his timing work in our lives in a way that we will never have to feel that we manipulatively brought about some better situation or circumstance for us. No, no, no. That's not going to give you a good night's rest. No, no. Uh, nothing, that, no nothing is a better pillow than a clear conscience. Okay. Then there, uh, the fourth one, God works through broken people. We've made that point again and again. And the opportunities for us to make that point are going to come up over and over and over and over again in the Jacob story. Trust in God and patience are better than human cleverness. We've already noted that one of the sort of mega themes in Scripture and in the book of Genesis particularly is human beings try to cleverly create a way where God has just promised. We believe the promises of God. We receive the promises of God rather than working in our own ingenuity, cleverness, and manipulation to bring about an end. Okay, we should live more for the hereafter than for the here and now. Right? And another way to say this is merely we need to take the eternal view rather than the temporal view. To sort of pan out and take the macro view, something that, yes, Esau failed to do, but I'm suggesting here that so did Jacob. That, it, that, it, that at some level, both of the brothers despised their birthright. They both took a narrow, short-sighted view. And this is a warning to us to take that macro view. Not the, not the, not the dot, but the line. Right? Think of your life not in the dot. Not, oh, I want this, I, I want that, I have to have this, I desire that, I cut. No, no, pan out, take a deep breath, right? just, just step back and, and have a look at the cosmic view and say, in the big picture, is this thing that I feel like I just have to have, this thing that I just have to do, this thing that I just have to say in the moment, is this in your long-term best interest? Okay, so we need to learn how to do this. The Apostle Paul in the New Testament says, to set your minds on the things that are unseen, not on the things that are seen, because the things that are seen, he says, are temporal, but the things that are unseen are eternal. And then finally, let's make the obvious point here about freedom. True freedom, unlike Esau imagined, is not the total absence of restraint, but is found in living within God's revealed will. Now, Esau doesn't understand this, but I'm suggesting that neither does Jacob at this point. And remember that statement there from Ellen White where she says that, you know, just Esau felt a sense of relief you know, once he got rid of that old birthright, those expectations, duties, obligations, responsibilities, he just, he just shook it off and he was now unobstructed. And there are many people today that just want to shake off God. They want to shake off religion. They want to shake off morality. They want to shake off scripture because they, it, they feel it obstructs them. It encumbers them. It confines them. It constrains them. Friends, true freedom is not found in getting to do whatever you think you want to do. True freedom is found in being able to do what you were created and made to do by God. That's freedom. The Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 5 verse 1 says, For freedom Christ has set us free. God's highest desire is your freedom. Your full and authentic freedom. If the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. God longs for us to be free, but we have to have a correct and biblical understanding of what it means to be free. Being free is being free to be free. The creature, the person, the man, the woman, the husband, the spouse, spouse, the wife, the son, the daughter, the Christian, the pastor, that God made us to be. The person that God made us to be. And when we live into that, that's freedom. Actually, strangely, choosing to do what you want to do in a given situation because you think that's freedom, very often results in bondage. All right, well, with that, we'll close our second session. No soup for you. We'll be back next week. I, this is going to be a great series. I cannot wait 
There's so much on offer here. A quick prayer and we will see you next week. Father in heaven, help us to take these lessons from this week into our hearts, into our homes, and into the weeks and months ahead of us is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.